What's up guys and gals? Welcome back to the Nerd Castle for our third episode. I can hold up the right number of fingers. Yes! Of q and A. I'm excited to be here today. This is one of my favorite things to work on at the end of each week. When I get to like Thursday, I'm like, oh yeah, I get to do my Q&A today. It's a lot of fun for me. And I appreciate all of the questions that you guys put down below in the last video. Now, as always, if I don't get your question in this video, copy and paste it. If you did it last video and I tried to get it there, but it just couldn't fit in or whatever, copy and paste your old question. If you got a new question, ask that too. I'm trying to maintain a list of people that have and have not been on the channel so that I can get everybody and be fair. I've been working from front to back, back to front. When I look at the list, next time I'm going to go from the middle down, middle up, just trying to make it fair for everybody because I noticed I have a habit of being like kind of lazy and just going top down. I'm like, well, that favors certain people. So anyways, I'm going to try and get everybody's questions, but first things first, Owen Lanja. I hope that's how you say your last name. It's either Owen Lang or Owen Lanja. Last week he said it was going to be his birthday, so I wanted to say happy birthday, man. You're 14 years old, very exciting age. You're going to have a lot of fun. You're like right on the cusp of high school and everything, which high school, best years of my life. I'll tell you that much. I had a blast when I was out there, so I wish you a very, very happy birthday from all of us here at the Nerd Castle. Have fun with that bow. You said that you got yourself a new piece of archery equipment. I hope you have fun with that as well. I wanted to make sure I got you shouted out, though, in this video, so happy birthday, bud. I apologize if I got your last name wrong. But you know what, Owen, I got you covered. Happy birthday. Homeless Gamer has got a question that he wants to ask. Hey, Splat, what is your P.O. Box? I would like to send you stuff. That was abridged. But anyways, my P.O. Box is P.O. Box 10602, Napa, California. I used to give you guys all the digits and everything down underneath, but actually it turns out that it gets there, even if I don't give you the street number and everything else. If you just do the P.O. Box and then the city, it gets there perfectly fine. So I never knew. The post office lady told me that. She's like, you know when people are sending these to you, they don't. you don't have to put down the street address or anything. I was like, really? Because I don't know. I was, I was probably one of the last generations. I was raised, I had a letter writing class where I had to learn how to properly write correspondence. Do they do that anymore? I had to handwrite letters all day to like fake people. It was ridiculous. And then you had to know how to do the envelope properly and they made you do it like 150 times if you didn't get the return address and the center part right. It was crazy. This is before people typed anything because nobody had like typewriters or anything. It was wild. It was super crazy, but yeah, I had a correspondence class, weirdly enough. Don't know why I brought that up, not really pertinent. Bro Stab, you may have already answered this, depending on viewer interest, maybe even several times. But you talked about growing up in a very religious family, and I was wondering how much that played into your life, and how much it does today. As a kid, it was a major part of my life. Religion, I went to church three times a week, so we went for a couple hours on Wednesday. And then we went to church twice on Sunday because my dad was a preacher, so we had to go in the morning for service, and we had to go at night for service, and I hated all three of them. I didn't like going. Uh, my family was super religious. I don't really know how to describe them other than calling them like sort of like Mennonites that use technology and like live in normal society. They, for example, like in their church services, they're not allowed to use like musical instruments, and they're not allowed to use like all these other things because for whatever reason they think it like detracts from the glory of God. They're really like hardcore Christian people. They aren't so much anymore. They've sort of loosened up as they've gotten older. So when I was a kid, it was absolutely a hundred percent like my entire life our entire foundation was in Christian religion and so Protestant Christian religion and so it was very right-wing it was very very strict it was very sort of like God was at the center point of every aspect of our lives like it was really actually quite a lot when I look back on it uh, I went to religious schools for a while where the teachers were allowed to like hit you with canes and stuff like that like I it was definitely kind of a wild ride but nowadays it actually doesn't affect me that much nowadays I I I respect people that are religious, or at least I try to. I know that I always make jokes because it's such like a fertile ground for me when I'm in like the stream and whatnot. I'm really good at writing religious humor because religion is what I know, and so I'm very, very good at sort of satirizing and sort of lampooning it. But at the same time, I don't look at, I don't really look down on anybody for like being part of a religion. It's not part of my life. But anyways, I'm somewhere in between like a agnostic and an atheist. I'm pretty close to the line of atheist, but honestly, it's something that I don't really think about. Religion is not something that factors into my day-to-day -day life right now, and it's not something that I feel like is important for me. If it's important for other people, it helps them get through their day. Fantastic, but for me, eh, in modernity, doesn't really do a whole lot for me. But when I was a kid, definitely, like, every day was like Jesus all day, or a day. Cody Gross wants to know, what is your favorite RPG game? Ooh, that's a tough one. That digs deep. My favorite RPG is probably the first Baldur's Gate, because Baldur's Gate 1 was like the perfect amount of D&D complication, but also the perfect amount of streamlining. Like, the whole system was designed in a way where it had enough D&D to be D&D, but at the same time, the game sort of automated a lot of the tedious stuff that you have to do when you play tabletop. Especially back in the day, I think that Baldur's Gate was AD&D, so it still used Thacko and a bunch of other stuff. So, not a lot of people like that system. I grew up playing Thacko, and so it didn't bother me at all. But I think it was the perfect amount when you got into Baldur's Gate 2 
it got quite a bit more complicated where it definitely drew a lot more ideas from D&D. &D. And so I felt like Baldur's Gate 2 was less accessible than the first game. And so I always liked the first game because you could kind of play it without having to worry about it too much. Whereas by the time you got to the second game, you had to focus heavily on canceling opponent spells and on kind of dispelling things. And just being very Johnny on the spot with all the various spells that the game had. All the various status effects and things like that. You had to be very, very careful about them. Which is something you didn't have to worry about in the first game. You kind of just hacked and slashed your way through it. It's kind of like Diablo a little bit more heavy. So anyways, Baldur's Gate 1 would probably be the one that I would throw out there. I like Final Fantasy VI. I like Final Fantasy 7. I like 8 a lot more than most people do too. A lot of people don't like 8, but I've always been a firm proponent of Final Fantasy 8. Fantasy Star 4, I mean there's a lot of games, it's hard for me to say. There are a lot of RPGs out there, but if I had to say just one, I would either say Shadowrun on the Sega Genesis or Baldur's Gate 1. If I had to be like, stamp of approval, and I 100% they were like, you can't dodge this question. Name your favorite game, now. Eh, I don't like to do that, but I would say probably Baldur's Gate or Shadowrun for the Sega Genesis. Justin Wallace! I was wondering what software you use to record your gaming. Do you record audio through your commentary microphone, or does it record the game audio through the capture software as well? Okay, so there's a couple of things right here, and I'm going to try and hit it all while being as untechnical as possible. So I use three different programs. I use Fraps, I use DXStory, and I use Bandicam. When I first started out, I only used Fraps because that was like three years ago, and Fraps was like the stuff at the time. Nowadays, I actually find Bandicam to be a little bit better than most softwares. I enjoy Bandicam a little bit more. It's very fire and forget, but the basic way that that works is I have three recording softwares because some games really don't like certain softwares, and you have no option. If you play a game, and it comes down to kind of your graphics card too, because some people, I have friends that can, for example, they can play Stalker with Fraps, but I cannot. Like, if I play Stalker, Fraps absolutely hates Stalker. And then DX Tory loves it, and Bandicam does okay with it as well. And so different softwares will do better with different games. And so I keep those so I can rotate very, very quickly. If I get a game on Tuesday morning and I have to have a video out by 1 o'clock in the afternoon, if this recorder doesn't work, I don't have to fiddle with it. I can just jump to the next one. That one doesn't work, jump to the next one. So I keep spares so I can just use whichever one works best at any given moment. The way that it works technically is the audio for the game is captured through the recording software. I capture my voice through my microphone, which goes into a second computer that I have that's running a program called Audacity. And in fact, I'm doing it right now so that I can splice that back in. And actually, it makes it easier to fiddle with your audio. So the game audio is captured through Bandicam. And then what I do is I record my commentary simultaneously. And at the end, I have a little thing that I do to sync up the audio. And then I just take the audio file that I record with my microphone and I sync it up with the video file that I captured. Bim Bam Bomb makes it very easy to get everything audio balanced properly. A lot of people like to capture their games and their microphone all through like Fraps or all through one program. You can do that, but it's going to take some trial and error to get the volume right. And a lot of games have big fluctuations in between the quiet points and the loud points. So I like to do it by hand in post when I put it into Vegas. Simon Klein asks, have you picked a lock before? What an odd question. No, I've jimmied a car door before using the thing that goes inside the window right there where you slide it through. Somebody showed me how to do that one time and I've jimmied a door with like a credit card where if it's closed, you can take the credit card and kind of jiggle it a little bit up and down and it'll knock out that little tongue thing that sticks out on the door and it'll open it so long as it doesn't have a deadbolt. But no, I've never actually picked a lock with like a hairpin or like a needle or anything like that. I've jimmied a couple of doors, but nope, never picked one. Me... The U. I think it's May the U. There we go. I could pronounce this. May the U. If you were stuck in a survival situation, what type of place would you want to be? Uh, Mediterranean, I think, would be the easiest to survive in. If you find a location that's sort of like the climate that we have in California, or if you find a location that's sort of like... I wouldn't say the Sierras, but a location like you would have up in Seattle and some of the greener areas, the wetter areas, or Oregon, some of the greener, wetter areas, that would be optimal for survival because things just sort of grow and it tends to be very wet and lush there all the time. If you could keep yourself dry, it's going to cause you problems in starting fires if you don't have like a lighter or anything else because the wood there tends to be very wet all the time. But if I had to pick, I'd go for that just because you could graze, you could find apples on trees because they grow naturally and things like that. Orange trees and all kinds of fruit trees around here you can make use of, almond trees and things like that that are just sort of like around walnuts. Things like that. I mean, walnuts are very calorie dense and they just grow all over the place around here. If you're in a Mediterranean setting though, it means there's going to be enough water, there's probably going to be creeks, there's pr it's probably going to be the easiest survival that you could do. I am experienced with desert survival as well, I don't know how well I would do in that situation. I, it's tough. You would have to find water. You would, you don't want to really go out at night because there's predators and things like that, but you don't want to go out during the day either because it's hot. It's tough, but I'd say if I got to pick, if I was like, yes, I want to survive in this situation, I'd go with probably like a Mediterranean climate. 
like California or Washington or Oregon or you know any of those coastal states have that's probably what I'd shoot for first it would be the easiest just based on resources available Krista 310 <laughs> here's a question I'm sure you've been asked you seem to be a lot smarter than a good number of people I like this question why do you do YouTube over a job that would probably pay a lot more actually YouTube pays very very well once you get to the point that I'm at and then there's a second half to the question. Also, do you consider yourself to be overeducated? Actually, no, I'd say undereducated is the way that I would look at it. So let me hit the back question first since I already started. I think I would be undereducated. I'm not very well read. I don't read a ton of books. In general, I look on Reddit a lot, and I read a lot of like random science things here and there, but I don't have any concerted focus on anything other than geology. And so I'd say that I'm probably undereducated by comparison to most people who are like avid readers or people who study philosophy, things like that, where they're forced to reach out and read a lot of stuff. I'm not very well read. I do read here and there, and I enjoy very specific topics. So for example, I know a lot about like North Korea. I know vague things about the Korean War and the history that leads into and after, because that's a subject that I'm sort I'm a little bit obsessed with it, I guess. I like it a lot. I've read a lot of books about it. I've watched a lot of movies and documentaries about it, and I enjoy it. But by and large, my areas of focus with regards to my education are very specific. And then anything outside of that, I'm just like, eh. So I'd actually say that I'm probably undereducated compared to most people. Like, I always find people who are very literate. They're very well-read. They've gone through their very... Where, well, they're well established when it comes to reading books and things of that nature about just a vast number of subjects. I just don't consume literature that often. And so I always find myself on my heels around a lot of people because they seem to be much, much better educated than I am. So I would say I'm undereducated. As for picking YouTube, it's because I enjoy the job. It's fun to do. It's a thing that like I get to wake up every day and I'm not like, I gotta go to work. Whereas most people's jobs are like that. I find that as I get older, all of my friends, they find jobs that pay very, very well but like they definitely are just doing the job for the money so that they can live on the weekends. And so I would rather have a job that pays less, but I have fun doing and I like waking up in the morning than doing a job that pays a lot more and is not fun at all. Now I'm lucky in that my job pays very, very well in between Twitch and YouTube. I'm compensated far more than I think that I deserve. Like seriously, sometimes I'm just like, I don't deserve this paycheck. I play video games all day and I talk into a microphone. It doesn't feel like strenuous labor to me because I used to be like a roofer, you know? Like it just, it doesn't seem like something you should be able to get a paycheck for, but I do through the marvels of the future. And so, hey, I'm going to take it because I love video games. It's something that I've been passionate about since I was two or three years old. I've played a lot of video games. I think that when I was growing up, people were like, oh, I don't want to go over to his house. He plays video games a lot and stuff like that because that's all that I like to do when I was young. And so this is kind of like the payoff for me, I guess. This is kind of just like, ah, it's the I told you so moment. Like, I get to do this. And so I, I appreciate my job. I love it every single day. It's cool that I get to wake up and entertain people and make people smile and play video games all the live long day. I very much enjoy it. And so I would take that if it paid less over something that pays more. What kind of car do you drive? That question comes from Drake Strahl. I have a 2005 Chevy Cavalier. That car is the pain in my ass that just keeps on giving, but on the plus side, it's got under 100,000 miles. I've thought about getting a new car just because I don't like my Cavalier, but it really sort of seems like a waste. It's under 100,000 miles. It gets me from here to there. I don't drive much anyways. I walk most places, and so, meh. I mean, I honestly, I don't put a lot of miles on it. I don't drive it very often. It kind of just sits in my driveway right now or my parking spot because I'm at an apartment complex. So I have a 2005 Chevy Cavalier. It's got like no power windows, no anything like that. Barely has power steering. It gets me from point A to point B. It has low miles. I don't use it very often. So eh, I don't really need it. Technically, I could sell it and I would get by perfectly fine with just like on foot and kind of just like, I guess, mooching off my girlfriend's car. But I don't know. That works out. What was your, oh, never mind. I almost skipped one. Wolfborn asks, here's a twist on the deserted island question. If you could take one, what music album would you carry with you for a real life threatening survival situation? So I, what, I, what I'd take from this is that if I had one album that I could listen to forever, I don't really know. I mean, I don't think there's any musical albums that would be intensely useful in a survival situation unless they came with like a compass or a compass, a compass or a magnifying lens or anything like that. Um... Probably, I don't know, for keeping my spirits up, I would probably go with Millen Collins' Penny Bridge Pioneers, maybe? That's probably either that or... I like Take Off Your Pants and Jacket or maybe Enema, Enema of the State by Blink-182. There's a couple albums in there that I think I could slot on in. I think that on the heavy metal end, Nightfall in Middle Earth was a really good album by Blank Guardian. That was, like, infinitely listenable. And then, hmm, 
No, I don't know, Megadeth Rust in Peace. In addition, I think Cryptic Writings was a pretty good album by Megadeth as well. I think that's probably my favorite. I don't know, like, Countdown to Extinction was a good album, and a lot of people love it, and Skin of My Teeth is by far one of my favorite metal songs of all time. But I think Cryptic Writings as an album was better than most of the body of Megadeth's work. I really like Cryptic. I think people are going to disagree with me, but I thought Cryptic Writings was a really, really good album. So any of the ones that I've mentioned would work. What was your dream job as a kid? I wanted to be a baseball player very, very badly. And then I had a brief period where I wanted to be a pro skater because I was getting better when I was kind of a freshman in high school. I was getting to the point where I was really, really solid at skateboarding. I had a really, really good ground game, like my kick flips and my heel flips and my double kick flips and my varials and all that kind of stuff. I could nail them like every single time. But my grind game was just so weak that I could never make it for it. My grind game was really, really weak. And it was just because, like, I think I lost my stomach for it as I got older. I ate shit really hard four or five times where it took me like a month or two to really recover from the injury. And it sort of just killed my nerve after a while. Like, it's just like, I really don't want to be like nursing a wound for another, you know, two or three months after this. And so I think I just, I neglected my grinding game because I so frequently hurt myself while doing it. And so I was bad on a rail and I was bad on a ledge. I mean, I could do basic grinds and things like that, but that's not good enough. You got to be able to transition in between. And so anyways, I wanted to be a pro skateboarder for a little while. I had a friend that got offered a sponsorship. He got offered a sponsorship by Element or something like that. Like they wanted him to be a pro skater and to like go to tournaments and things like that. Skate contests and things of that nature. He turned it down. He was a punk rocker at the time that I was really good friends with and he said that it was selling out. And I was like, dude, I think you're walking away from a big, big life opportunity. I always wonder if he regretted that because he was like dead set that that was selling out and it would kill skateboarding for him to get paid to do it. Like, I don't know, man. That's got to live in the dream, but I, I know each person to each their own, I suppose. Purple Melon Man, he says, What game do you currently play to relax in your free time? Path of Exile. I've been playing a lot of Path of Exile the last couple days. I've also been playing Empyreon a lot. I mean, I've been playing that on the side because there's a lot of maintenance work I have to do, and I legitimately enjoy the game. And so whenever I go to, like, record it, there's, like, two or three hours before that that goes into preparing for it. Unless, and if I don't do that, I end up with a bunch of episodes of me running around just like doing nothing and it's kind of boring. So I've been playing Empyreon and Path of Exile. If you want to play Path of Exile with me, feel free. My name is Leomond in game. L-E-O-M-O-N-D-E. -E. That's always the name that I use in every RPG. I've used it since like the dawn of time. And so anyways, if you want to hook up with me and play the game a little bit, I'm not very good at it, but I'm working on a build right now that I think is going to be pretty cool. I'm playing a two-handed duelist that I'm having a blast with, so that should be pretty fun. Uh, Lax Biscuit asks, I don't know if that's Iax Biscuit or Lax Biscuit because the I and the L looks the same for me. The lowercase L looks the same, or I'm sorry, I think it's, I think it's Lax, I, I think it's Lax Biscuit, I'm pretty sure. Anyways, the font that I have right now makes both the I's and the L's look the same. Splat, do you have any advice on which Warhammer 40k novels to read first? I do, there are so many I don't even know where to start. Yeah, so you could start in a couple of different places. You could go with Sandy. It depends who you want to follow, too. It really sort of does, because most of the novels focus either heavily on Imperial Guard, or they focus very heavily on Space Marines. If you wanted to get started with Space Marines, I got a book right here that I would highly recommend. It's all, like, the most famous authors that write for 40K. It's a bunch, it's a collection of short stories by them that are about anything and everything Space Marines. And so, if you like a bunch of different chapters and you just want to get your feet wet, the book is called Let the Galaxy Burn. It's pretty good. It's about, well, let me take a look here. It's almost a thousand pages of just like 40 page short stories written by different sci-fi authors. And there's some big guys in there. I think Orson Scott Card did a couple in here. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of random authors in here that you wouldn't expect to do 40K. And it's interesting to see their takes on the world. And at the same time, it's a very good primer to the Space Marines and all their different chapters. So if you like Space Wolves, they got things for that. If you like Salamanders, they got things for that. If you like Dark Angels, whatever, there's a story in there about that particular chapter. And it's a good place to learn a little bit about all the chapters and how they approach the universe. If you wanted to go in the Imperial Guard direction, there's books like Eisenhorn. There's all the books about Caiaphas Cain. Those are funny, though. So if you wanted to read books that are sort of humorous while at the same time in the world of Warhammer 40K, Caiaphas Cain is a commissar who exists in the world during Abaddon's invasion of, like, Mm, M43 or something like that. Either way, Kaya Viscani's a commissar who propaganda builds up to be like a hero of the Imperium, but in reality, he's a giant coward who just happens to be in the right place at the right time all the time. And the irony of the situation is he spends all of the books trying to avoid combat as much as possible, but because he's a hero of the Imperium and he keeps fanning the flames of kind of like his rock star status in the kingdom or in the Imperium, 
he keeps ending up in more and more dangerous situations and just like being like FML about the whole thing. And so Caiaphas Kane is humorous. I think it's by Sandy Mitchell. I think it's called Caiaphas Kane, Defender of the Imperium. And then there's a second one called like Hero of the Imperium or something like that. I can't remember. There's two. There's like Defender of the Imperium and Hero of the Imperium. And I think both of those are like abridged collections of all of the short stories that Sandy Mitchell wrote about him, I think. Velvet Shadows, has playing games as a job sapped your enjoyment of them in any way? Actually, yeah, it's weird. It's really, really weird. I used to play games like 10 hours a day outside of school or outside of work. Like if I was not at work or if I was not at school, I played games nonstop. And nowadays, now that games are my job and like reviewing games and doing impressions and let's plays, I find that the games that I want to play in my free time, they almost always end up on the channel anyways. And so that's how I fill in my time. Since my work time is sort of like my leisure time, it has burned me out a little bit on certain genres and certain games to the point where I become cynical. And I don't like that very much. And so when I'm in my free time, I actually don't play games that much. When I'm in my free time, I'm usually like hiking or I go and I just window shop at stores or I just spend time out. I very much enjoy like going out and just grabbing like a burrito at a taqueria around here and just sort of like chilling in front of the building at one of the little tables they have and just like people watching. I mean, in general, I don't have a whole lot of leisure materials that I... I just like, I, when I'm in my free time, I don't play games much anymore, so I would say, yeah, as much as I hate to admit it, it doesn't make me enjoy the games less. Like, I enjoy playing video games as much as I ever did, but it's made it so that when I'm in my free time now, because I work like eight, nine hours a day, like getting videos edited and things like that, when I'm not playing games for the channel, I find that the other times that I spend, I'd rather watch a movie or like read a book or just hang out on the couch, watch a documentary with my girlfriend or whatever else. I don't know. I don't play a whole lot of games outside of the channel now. I do. I try to get one or two hours in of just like games that are not involved with the channel just to keep myself diverse and kind of playing a lot of different things. But I mean, my backlog of games right now is enormous because my work time is my playtime. And so it's a little bit weird like that. Let's see here. Next question up. White Guard asks, how long have you been with your girlfriend? That's actually a really simple and easy question. We have been dating for three years. And so we're coming up on our third anniversary in the next couple months. And so I've been with her since college, actually. I dated a girl in high school for a long time. And then once I got to college, I started dating my current girlfriend. And, you know, it's like, it's weird. You find somebody that you just have, like, insane chemistry with. And after that, you start to realize, like, how shit all your other relationships were. And you're just like, oh, I thought that, like, fighting and bickering and just being angry all the time was, like, part of being in a relationship because that's the way everybody portrays it to me. But then, like, you find that person who is kind of like the yin to your yang where, like, you just complement each other really well and your chemistry is just undeniable. And it's weird how the years go by. Like, I could say when I dated other people that we've been together, like, two years and it feels like a really long time in this relationship. I've dated her for three years now and it feels like time has just gone, like... It's like that. It's so quick because like we really, we fit, we're both really easy going. I think that's the first part is that like we match each other in terms of like we both kind of have like that stoner sort of like, ah, eh, it's all good attitude. And so because of that, we don't argue. We kind of just like, you know, we give when we need to give, we take when we need to take. And it seems to work out pretty well just intuitively. Like we have our problems like any other relationship every now and again, but this one is by far the smoothest that I've ever been in my entire life. And so we've been dating for three years to answer your question. That's going to be the end of our Q&A for today. My name is Splattercat. q and Hey, I messed it up. I didn't do it. You guys are I'll flog myself when I get off camera It's always a blast answering your questions I've tried to be a little bit more brief in this one as a test to see if I could hit more questions I actually doubled up on questions in this one, but I tried to go faster And so I'm gonna see how it goes Just know that I'm playing around with this series and I'm trying new things each time to see what people like best And also what works for me best to hit as many people as possible. I, it's a blast I love doing this series and so I want to thank you for putting those questions out there if you wanted to support the channel, there's a lot of ways to do that. I get that question pretty frequently. Look down below. Leave me a like. You already checked the video out. That's a great way to support the channel is just by checking videos out and liking things. But if you wanted to help out, you can go to Patreon and you can donate through there. If you wanted to get Loot Crate, if you're going to buy Loot Crate anyways, if you use my code, it costs you nothing. And it also helps the channel keep the lights on because I'm endorsed by Loot Crate and they throw a little silver my way for each person that signs up. And so if you were looking to support the channel, you can do it that way. If you wanted to send me anything like fan mail, 10602, P.O. Box 10602, Napa, California is where you're going to send it at. Uh, please pay your postage. <laughs> I've had so many people not pay their postage and I get there and they're like, so you owe $6.85. 
Pay your, it's not a big deal. Like, I could pay the postage. If you really want to send it out my way, I'll pay the postage. It's not that big of a deal. If it's like $100, I'm sending it back to your ass, though. So, anyways, I love doing this series. It's one of my favorite things ever. Q&A is one of my favorite series that I've probably started in the last year or so, and it's a blast. Leave me some questions down below. If I didn't get to you, copy and paste your questions, and add any additional questions to your comment that you want. I'll try and get you next week. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see y'all later.